The focus of this lesson will be on principal ideals. So throughout this lesson, we're going to assume that R is a ring with identity one that's not equal to zero. So whenever we say R is a ring, it will be a ring with identity. So now let A, capital A, be any subset of R. So we're going to talk about ideals generated by a subset. And then in particular, a subset with just one element. So just like we had notation for a cyclic group, we're going to use the same notation for a, an ideal generated by a subset A. So this notation is going to denote an ideal generated by A, but it's also the smallest ideal of R. that contains A. So we're gonna call this the ideal generated by the set A. Let's call this definition one. Definition two, an ideal generated by a single element let's call the element A. Now we just denote this by these angle brackets with the element A in it. And this is called a principal ideal. So a principal ideal is an ideal generated by a single element. So this lesson, we're gonna focus on these principal ideals. Um, we're also gonna look at an example or two of finitely generated ideals. So these are ideals generated by a finite number of elements of the ring R. It's an ideal generated by a finite set A1, A2, AN is denoted by angle brackets. And then you list the elements, the generators, just like we did with finitely generated subgroups or groups. So this is called a finitely generated ideal. So let's be a little bit more specific about what we mean by generated by a set. So these facts, first, the ideal generated by the set A is actually equal to the ideal R, A, R, 
and we already defined the product of two ideals. So this set consists of finite sums of elements of the form R1, A1, R1 prime, where R1, R1 prime are in R, and all the AIs are in set A. So you take elements of this form, and you take finite sums of these, so R2, A2, R2 prime, plus way to rn a n r n prime again where all the all the r i's and r i primes are in the ring r the a i's are in a and n is a natural number so we have all these any element that can be written as a finite sum of elements of R times elements of A times elements of R. So if you look at the principal ideal generated by the element A, the only difference is now all the A's, I's are just replaced by the single element A. So this would be the ideal R, A, R, which again consists of all finite sums of the form R1 A R1 prime plus R2 A R2 prime plus Rn A Rn prime. Where all the R's are in the ring and N as in natural number. Now it's more, a little more interesting, a little more easy to deal with when R is commutative. So when R is a commutative ring, then this principal ideal generated by A is just the set of all R multiples of the element A. So this ideal generated by A just consists of all elements of the form R times A, where R is an element of R. Let's look at a quick example of finitely generated ideals. Well, in the ring R, R and the trivial ideal zero are principal ideals. Because I could write R as the ideal generated by one and zero would be the ideal generated by zero. Now let's look at some more examples of principal ideals. So in this example, we're gonna be working with the ring of integers. So we saw earlier that the set NZ is an ideal of Z. For any integer N. And these ideals are actually principal ideals. Since nz just equals all the multiples of n, this is generated by n, but also you can think of it as principal ideal generated by negative n. It turns out that every ideal of z is a principal ideal. So in fact, since every 
subring of the integers. has the form nz for some n. Then we see that every ideal has the form nz, and therefore every ideal of z is principal. So we see that every ideal of the integers is principal. Now, some more facts for positive integers. M and N. And think about the relationship between MZ and NZ. Well, mz will be a subset of nz exactly when n divides m in the integers. So if and only if n divides m. So for example, the set of multiples of four are contained in the set of multiples of two, because two divides four. Another fact, further, the ideal generated by two non-zero integers say M and N. Well, this has to be a principal ideal. And it turns out that this is the ideal generated by the greatest common divisor of M and N. So this is the principal ideal. Generated by, let's say, D, which is the GCD of M and N. So we'll study this in the future, but the integers is our first example of what we call a PID, a principal ideal domain, in which every ideal is principal. Now let's look at the ring R adjoint X. So this is the ring of polynomials in the variable X where all the coefficients are real numbers. So again, let's let this be the ring of polynomials in X with real coefficients. And let I be the subset of this ring consisting of polynomials with constant term zero. think about a polynomial with constant term zero, every term in this polynomial will be a multiple of x, the variable x. So we see that every element of i is an element of the ring generated by the variable x. So we see that i must be the principal ideal generated by x.
Next, let's look at the set of polynomials in X with integer coefficients. Let's look at the ideal generated by two elements, two and X. Well, this ideal is not a principal ideal. So we're going to show this. So we just showed that earlier that the integers is a principal ideal domain. So every ideal in the integers is principal. But when we take the set of the ring of polynomials with integer coefficients, this is not a principal ideal domain because the ideal generated by 2 and x is not principal. First note that the ideal generated by 2 and x consists of all polynomials of the form 2px plus x qx, where p of x and q of x are polynomials with integer coefficients. So I can write any element of the ideal generated by 2 and x in this form. And so that we see that the elements of this ideal are the polynomials whose constant term is even. So therefore, this ideal consists of polynomials with integer coefficients whose constant term is even. So let's assume for a contradiction that the ideal generated by 2 and x is actually a principal ideal. So assume for a contradiction that the ideal generated by 2 and x actually is principal, so it's generated by some polynomial a of x. Well, then we notice that the integer 2 is a polynomial in x, since 2 is an element of the ideal generated by 2 and x, 2 must be an element of the principal ideal generated by a of x. And, and therefore, we could write 2 as a multiple of a of x. So there must be some p of x in the ring such that 2 equals p of x times a of x. So think about this equation. 2 is a polynomial of degree 0 and the, the degree of p of x times a of x is the sum of the degrees of p of x and a of x so we see that p of x and a of x must both be constant polynomials. So since the degree of p of x times a of x equals degree of p of x plus the degree of a of x
we see that p of x and a of x must be constant polynomials. And hence, integers. So we know that a of x now is an integer, but it's an integer that divides two. Well, the only divisors of two in the integers are plus or minus one and plus or minus two. So if a of x equals plus or minus one, then the ideal generated by a of x just equals the whole ring. So then the, the ideal generated by a of x equals the whole ring of polynomials with integer coefficients. But this can't be since one is in this ring, but one is not a polynomial with an even constant term. So it can't be in the ideal generated by two and x. So there's no way that a of x could equal plus or minus one. So a of x must equal plus or minus two. Well, then the ideal generated by a of x is the ideal generated by two which is the same as the ideal generated by negative two. So this means that every coefficient in this ideal must be even. This is another contradiction. Because after all, x is one of the generators of this ideal. So x is in the ideal generated by two and x, but x doesn't have an even coefficient. So x can't be an element of the ideal generated by two, which consists of all polynomials with even coefficients. So x can't be in this ideal generated by two since x has an odd coefficient. So this shows that the ideal generated by two and x cannot be principal. So it's kind of interesting that every ideal in the, of the integers is principal However, this is not the case in the ring of polynomials with integer coefficients. So what if I change the coefficient? So let's consider the ring of polynomials with rational coefficients. Let's look at the same ideal, the ideal generated by two and x. Well, this ring, this ideal is actually the entire ring.
And the reason is because now we can multiply two by the rational number of one half. So since this ideal contains the element, contains the element two, and it contains every multiple of two, so one half times two, which is one. So we see that the ideal generated by two and x in q adjoint x is actually just equal to q adjoint x, and it's therefore a principal ideal generated by one. So this example leads to the following theorem. Let I be an ideal of R Again, we're assuming that R is a ring with identity one. And we have the following two parts. The ideal equals R if and only if I contains a unit. And secondly, if we assume that R is commutative, And R is a field if and only if its only ideals are the trivial ideal zero and the ring R itself. So for the proof of one, let's assume that I equals R. So if I equals R, then I contains the unit one. So, establishes the forward implication. So conversely, let's assume that I contains the unit U. So if I contains the unit U, then by definition of a unit, there must be another element V, where such that V times U equals the identity one some V in the ring R. Then for all R in R, we can write R as R times one, but one we can write as V times U, and then by associativity this equals R times V times u, which must be contained in the ring i. So thus r is a subset of i, and since i is a subset of r, we must have that i equals r. So that establishes part one of this theorem. Now for the proof of two, let's assume that R is commutative. And recall that R is a field 
if and only if every non-zero element of R is a unit. So let's prove the forward implication, that is, let's assume that R is a field and show that the only ideals of R are 0 and R. So if R is a field, then every non-zero element is a unit, and so therefore, every non-zero ideal contains a unit. And then by one, every non-zero ideal must be equal to R. So the only non-zero ideal is R. So that establishes the forward implication that the only ideals could be zero and R. So now for the reverse, now suppose that zero and R are the only ideals of R. And let's let u be any non-zero element of R. So let u be a non-zero element of R. So we're gonna show that u is a unit, and therefore, since u was an arbitrary non-zero element of R, R must be a field. So let's look at the ideal generated by u. Then the ideal generated by u, well, it must be non-zero, and therefore the only choice for the only possibility for this ideal is R. So then this ideal generated by u must equal R. But since one is in R one must be an element of the ideal generated by u. And if one is in the ideal generated by u, then one must be able to be written as some element v times u for some element v in the ring. Therefore, u is a unit. Since u is an arbitrary non-zero element, we see that every non-zero element of R is a unit. which is the same as saying that R is a field. So we see that an ideal of R equals R if and only if I contains a unit, and further when R is commutative, R is a field if and only if its only ideals are the trivial ideal zero and the ring R itself.